Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Cynthia Lane. Um, I first met Cynthia when we sat next to each other at the Amherst SCI course, or whatever it was, with Maharshi and Maharshi Mashogi in 1971, Amherst, Massachusetts. And Cynthia was glowing and giggling as she is now, and uh, she told me that she had just come back from uh, Mallorca, Spain, where she had been doing long meditations for six months. And I thought, whoa, six months, she must be at least in cosmic consciousness or something. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that was my first recollection of Cynthia. And uh, we've kind of known each other ever since and lived in the same town for years here and there, although these days you live in New Mexico, don't Santa you? Fe. Santa Fe, mm -hmm. which uh, we'd probably move to if we could afford it. <laughs> uh, maybe you should... Um, <laughs> Ask about that. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, the theme of these shows, as those who have watched some of them already know, is that um, we have a discussion with somebody who has had a spiritual awakening. And um, we don't mean that in the religious sense or in the sense of, you know, the adoption of some new set of beliefs or change in attitude, although <clears throat> those things might come about as a result of what we're referring to. But rather we mean, we mean something more fundamental than that. Uh, something which traditionally has been termed uh, self-realization or enlightenment um, or higher states of consciousness and all sorts of terms like that. Uh, we tend to avoid the, the word enlightenment in these interviews because it, to me it has too much of a sort of a superlative static connotation and uh, in my experience everyone is uh, still on the pro you know, progressing and evolving and opening to new levels of clarity and so on. And so we kind of want to evolve, avoid the the, uh, the notion that anybody, unless anyone likes to, would like to claim this, that anybody has uh, sort of reached the the penultimate degree of human evolution. Although I did have one guy who wanted to be interviewed, who said that he can guarantee me that he is more enlightened than anybody I have interviewed or could conceivably interview. <laughs> so um, so far I haven't taken him up on the offer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how that interview would go. He also didn't want his face on the video for some reason. <laughs> he wanted it to just be an audio and not to announce his name. Um, so in any case, <laughs> welcome, Cynthia. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing this. So um, most of these interviews we have done in a kind of a um, chronological way. You know, a person has kind of traced their, their journey. Uh, over the years and how it's unfolded. We can do it that way if you want. Or, you know, some people would like to just sort of plunge in and talk about the moment when they woke up, if there was a moment. Some, for some people, it kind of snuck up on them so they couldn't put a, a, you know, a finger on the date. So how would you like to proceed? Well, I'll let you choose it because it was a gradual thing. Really. Gradual thing? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so how did it start? I mean, you were in high school and you were reading Zen books or something. And <laughs> I wished. <laughs> No, actually, at, in high school, I was very rebellious, uh -huh. quite depressed, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that thing pretty much intensified <laughs> both those things yeah. in, in college, and um, when I got to San Francisco State, I, I, for, I went to Reed College in Portland, Oregon for two mm -hmm. years, and then I transferred down to San Francisco State, and uh, I'd say one moment of awakening was very important that if I was unhappy, it wasn't the fault of the environment. The fault was in here. You realize that? Yes, uh -huh. yes. So that was a real gift, and that this is what had to change. Okay. And the other thing that happened was, uh, all my life I had had people coming to me for advice. Uh -huh. Just one of those people that you know, people like. I broke up on. with my boyfriend. What should I do? That kind yeah, of thing. right. Yeah. And and one day a friend of mine came to me and said, so and so just did something, and it seemed like something. Outrageous, and I said, "Well, why did that person do that?" And she said, "Well, you told them to." I said, "Oh my God!" <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought, if if people are going to listen to me, I better become wise. Yeah. And I'm not going to give out another word of advice until I come to whatever that place is. Uh -huh. Little did I know, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you know the equivalent of lifetimes would pass until until that would happen. But I'd say those those were two critical moments. Huh. And then, um, of course, I was living in, in San Francisco at a time when everything was waking up. And this everything is like was late 60s or something? Mm, yes, yeah. it was. I moved to, I started at San Francisco, San Francisco State in 1966. Ooh. <laughs> 
crunch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, was trying all kinds of things, this kind of meditation and Zen Buddhism and... and uh, Did you go through a drug phase? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to leave that out. Right, right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I did. And it had a role. It yeah. had a role. And, um, and then um, some friends of mine had learned TM. Mm -hmm. And they'd been talking about it for a year, but it wasn't easy to learn because... It, it didn't. There weren't that many teachers in those days. Yeah, and the courses were offered, you know, only now and then, and they were in Berkeley. Yeah. And then um, Marishi actually came to Berkeley huh. and gave an introductory lecture. And I was, uh, you know, not convinced at all. And I remember sitting in the audience, really, really, you know, trying to take take it in. And uh, I do remember a couple of the the jokes that he told, uh -huh. which which really made an impression on me. I will also say that I went out and took a cigarette break in the middle of the what? lecture, <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> so that's where I was. Yeah. And then I remember at the end of the lecture, after everybody left, I went and sat in the front row and I just watched him. Oh, he was I, still there? Yeah, he was kind of hanging around answering Talking questions. People, yeah. And I wanted to know what a guru was. Uh -huh. I just really wanted to know what a guru was. And then, you know, I, I did learn TM shortly after and it was almost like uh, I had a ring through my nose and somebody was pulling it and I just... Uh -huh. Just got know, into it. Yeah, just yeah. got into it. Started to have good experiences off the bat? I did. I was completely disobedient. You know, we were told to meditate maybe 20 minutes, maybe it was 30 minutes twice a day, and I immediately meditated for an hour or however long I felt. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't much into rules then, and right. I guess I'm still not. But, yeah. And I loved, you know, it was easy for me to do that. Yeah. I would just sink, and it was great. And, right. Yeah. And then I began to, you know, uh, develop, you know, a, a, a friendship, you know, a network, and it became, you know, a, you know, a world. Right. And um, so that was how that got started. And um, I did, you know, I, I, I did, I laughed for the first four days after I learned to Laughed? Yeah, I laughed. Yeah, yeah. And I really had been pretty depressed huh. for most of my life. I mean, I was really, you know, struggling. And, yeah. and um, so this, this was a big shift for me, and I, you know, I'm very, very grateful for that. Yeah, well, that's interesting because I've always thought of you as a very jovial, cheerful person, you know. It took a while, but so I So it wasn't here. just the first four days. I mean, <laughs> Kept yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is what year? I learned TM on November third, nineteen sixty-seven, in Berkeley, California. Okay. Yeah, it was about six months before I learned. Or something. Uh huh. Um, and then you started. Did you start to go on some long courses or anything? Then, Squaw Valley. Or yes, Marshy came to Squaw Valley, right. and that was the you know the leadership training program, and that was a, that was a big you know another big breakthrough. That's when I decided that. Um, I wanted to be a teacher, right. and um, you know, a number of a number of interesting things happened on the course. One one was, uh, I, 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 my roommate. You know, we all had to have roommates. Uh, my roommate used humongous amounts of hairspray, and I couldn't stand <laughs> meditating in that room. Right. So I would go start climbing up the mountain, looking for the perfect place to meditate. And of course, two hours would pass before I found yeah. <laughs> the perfect place to <laughs> meditate. <laughs> and then one day, I remember Marshy commenting on the lecture, and those of you who are spending all your time looking for the perfect place to meditate, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I did, I did decide that I wanted to be a teacher, mm -hmm. you know, at, at the end of that. And I began to, you know, went back and started to work and save money and yeah. all that kind of thing. At this stage of the game, how much would you say you had changed in terms of your kind of subjective uh, experience of life? Um, I think I began to feel much more hopeful and optimistic about life, yeah. which I hadn't before. Uh -huh. And also, you know, I'd begun to ha develop a community right. of friends, and that made a big, you know, that, that was having that supportive community. Sure. Um, but I was still, you know, a flower child, there was no doubt about it. Yeah, well, you're in San Francisco. <laughs> in Rome. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Squaw Valley, that was summer of 68, I believe. Yeah. And then, uh, but you didn't become a teacher until 1970, something like that, because Mallorca, mm -hmm. right? Well, I had been accepted to, go, yeah, I'd been accepted to go to an India course. Oh, I see. And I didn't have quite enough money saved uh -huh. yet, so I put it off one more course. I see. And it turned out that that, that previous course, was the last course in India. Right. So then I get a letter saying, what, one week I get a letter saying, you're accepted to go to India, and ecstasy, you know, and the next week I get a letter saying, there's not going to be an India course. Mm. I just was devastated. Yeah. I was just, I, I wanted to go to India so bad. So then there was Estes Park, Colorado. Well, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I had saved a lot, you know, all this money to be with Maharishi, so I decided I'm going to use it all to be with Maharishi. 
So I went to Humboldt, and then I went to Austria, to Kosen. Oh. And then I went to the British Isles and hitchhiked around the British Isles oh. for a couple of months. And then I went to, um, and, and, and I ended up giving TM lectures in the youth hostels. Because oh, I, I was the only vegetarian, so people would ask me, you know, why you're yeah, yeah. And, and so I went to teacher training uh, in December of 1970, and then stayed for okay. six months. Cool. So, uh, Let's shift it a little bit more to the subjective, because some people listening uh, to this aren't going to care that you went yeah. to Austria oh, yeah, 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 and yeah, all yeah. these places. <laughs> say, so what? I've yeah, been there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so we want to kind of lead up to the idea of, you know, spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, a lot of people who, you know, were new meditators were told that uh, it might happen in five to eight years. Okay. And um, there are people who have been doing it for, you know, 30, 40 years now who still don't mm -hmm. feel like they're anywhere close. Mm -hmm. um, and so in your case, what was the scenario? I mean, did you have glimpses of what we might call self-realization early on and they became more and more clear and frequent and stabilized or mm -hmm. how did it go? <clears throat> um, I would say it, in terms of steps of, of noticing something, mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, my first year of teaching, I, taught, I was able to teach a lot. I, I, part of my path was surrender. You know, I, I, I basically, it took me a long time to surrender. I watched Maharishi for a long time. I was very careful. But once I surrendered, wham, that was it. And so I think part of my growth was surrender and wanting to serve him mm -hmm. and, and, and teach through serving him. And, and I just taught my brains out. You know, yeah. my, my first year of teaching, I taught about 500 people, which mm -hmm. was... Wonderful, and and I would just at the end. Sometimes we would teach, you know, twenty people in a day, and at the end of the day, I was in the zone. For lack of a better, I don't know what to say. So, yeah. so there was that growth. This, I, I think, as for me, the path was as much the act of teaching as meditating. Uh -huh. So the, the teaching part was at least as significant as the actual meditation. And then um, I think it was. It's hard to remember years. I remember one day I was leading, um, you know, an ATR course. Those were the the course, the rest courses for teachers at Cobb Mountain in California. And one day I, I realized, and I started witnessing, and that was a real sudden. Hmm. I was not doing anything anymore. Yeah. Uh, there was no inner sense of doing, and this was, this probably would have been around 1973 or 74. Right. So let's zero in on that a little bit. So. Uh -huh. Um, by witnessing, you just described it a little bit, no, no sense of doing anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, were you just sort of sitting there giving a lecture or something and all of a sudden that happened? Or did it, you wake up one morning and, uh, and there was a sense of that or what? There had been experiences of that before. Sometimes when I was teaching, uh -huh. I would suddenly, you know, out of nowhere just become gigantic. Right. And it wasn't me speaking anymore. Right. And, and, I, and at the same time, there would be this sense of ecstatic gratitude uh -huh. and you know how I kept talking I don't know yeah. <laughs> but it was like so, so there had been a sort of an expansion and a contraction uh -huh. expansion contraction like that and then one day I just uh, you know it, it was just there and it was very very vivid mm -hmm. I, cu I could not have any sense of doing anymore right. there, it was like uh, I never spoke mm -hmm. so I could come to the end of the day and feel like I never said anything, and right. I have to remind myself, oh, yes, you did. Yeah, you've been talking all day, yeah, right. <laughs> eating lunch, and right, doing right. all this stuff. Yeah, so, so yeah. It, it, that I, it, I'd say the actual stabilization where it was just there all the time, mm -hmm. that, that came around 73 or 74. Okay. And uh, let's elaborate on that a little, bit, mm -hmm. a little bit, because some people might find that a confusing notion in that, you know, if you weren't doing anything, how were you doing something? I mean, who is the you you're referring to, uh -huh. and so on and so forth? You know, because most people identify with themselves as being this body, which, you mm -hmm. know, has a certain age, a certain size, a certain personality, mm -hmm. likes and dislikes, and so on. And so, you know, obviously you're not implying that your body stopped doing things or that people no longer heard you speak, but you're saying that what you identified as who you essentially were was recognized and the nature of that was that it was not doing anything it was silent my, my inner reality my inner knowing was that there was nobody doing anything mm -hmm. you know and the, and and I it's so I could hear myself talk yeah and I knew I was talking and I could hear my you know I could 
watch myself drive the car or whatever, but there was, my inner reality was absolute non-doing. Yeah. And did you feel like you still were a person on some level, or did you feel like there's absolutely nobody home and there, there, I, there is no, nothing which could be identified as me? At that point, I, there was still, a, you know, definitely a person. Uh -huh. So, so there was the, an inner, an inner reality of non-doing, and then there was a person. Yeah. Who had? Who did stuff? Who had? And, who did and, stuff? And had some problems. Uh -huh. even. Well, is there not still? Well, I don't want to jump ahead, but is there not still a person who does stuff and has problems sometimes? No. And eats and sleeps yeah, and yeah, breathes yeah. and. It, it, it's it's very different now. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is 73. So 74, Four. maybe. Yeah. Okay. With me. And, uh, and what happened during that period when, you know, once that had been established and you felt like you weren't doing anything, there was no one doing anything um, day and, and night, what happened when you slept? Any, did you just go conk out or was there some inner awareness? There was some inner awareness, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, but I also, it, I'd say it wasn't as consistent in sleep. Uh huh. So you, you know, or as if it didn't sleep. So you, you'd wake up in the morning and you wouldn't really have been awake the whole time, but you'd sort of, you know, there it is again, the, it the silence, I'm not doing anything. Right, right. It yeah. wasn't so vivid at night. Okay. Yeah. So 74. So that's not, that's pretty good. That almost fulfills the five to eight year thing. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can argue that that never happened. Yeah. Uh, so then you proceeded along, going on courses. I know I'm uh -huh. saying this because I know that's what yeah. you did, because that's what I did. And um, you know, we waved to each other. Yeah, right. we were teaching, going on courses, teaching, going on courses, and that okay. probably went on for a decade or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd say the next big leap came uh, in what Marsh used to call the six-month courses. Right. And I ended up being able to round for a year. Round means oh, meditate yeah. a lot, with, interspersed with some yoga asanas. Uh, yeah, and, right. and with Marshy coming in, giving lots of input and all that. Right. And that, the, I took some just gigantic leaps huh. there in terms of um, sh uh, there's witnessing and then there's, there's being, being just infinite and everywhere, mm -hmm. you know. And so, for instance, one day I came outside and I was just, every, it's hard to talk about it, I was just everywhere, I was in everything, I was everywhere. And, and so the whole idea of going anywhere, even walking, was impossible. And, I mean, even, uh, we didn't have the flying stuff then, but it just seemed to me like I, I should just drift away. Yeah. But there was, no, there was no away, there was no place to go. And I really understood what Marshy meant about, you know, just a tiny remain of ignorance because there was just enough of me left to register that I was actually walking. Yeah. But there was really no sense I, of, of going anywhere, no matter how much I walked, because I was already everywhere. So you were probably taking walks with your friends after lunch and stuff like that, talking and walking and, uh -huh. and doing stuff. But but and and they might not, not have had a clue unless you told them that right, this was right. going on. But your predominant re reality was what you just said. Right, right. And then and the, and I could feel my heart go out and embrace objects, uh -huh. and it was as if I loved everything so much that it became myself. Mm. So it was almost like something came out of my heart and embraced the object with just such love that it became myself. Yeah, great appreciation. Like, yes. Yeah. So you'd see a tree or a squirrel or something, and it would become yourself. It would become myself, and but I would actually feel this. It was as something came out of my heart and wrapped around the tree hmm. and and made it myself. Yeah. In love. So there was some kind of active. Yes. Subtle active. Very subtle. Process going on. Mm -hmm. Huh. So there was that, and then um, you know we had experiences with soma and just you know all kinds of openings. There. Soma means what? Uh, soma is, in my understanding, I have two understandings of Soma. One is, when the, the small self meets the big self, in the, in the, in the Soma mandalas it's called the grinding stones. When the small mm. self meets the big self. Oh, so that's what the grinding stones are all about. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> then the metabolism starts to produce this very, very fine substance uh -huh. called Soma. And Soma feeds the finest, the fine, the way Marshy explained it was that the senses 
have two values. There's, there's the structure, so there's you have your eye, and then there's a deva, there, there's a lively intelligence that makes, it, makes that structure actually see, and that the, the, fine, the devata lived on the finest structural level of the, of, of the sense, and soma was what could, the only thing that could feed the devata, that mm. could go in, on that finest level. So as the soma f flowed, every time you transcended, and it was literally ground out by your metabolic system, your, that's part of how your senses became more refined. Hmm. So the average person uh, must have a devata down there somewhere. <laughs> Everybody has one. They have it. <laughs> is, is it all one devata for the sense of sight, or does each one have their own devata? Each per and by, de by devata we mean a sort of an impulse of intelligence. A lively in an intelligence, yeah. like a, yeah. an expression or a yeah, seed of intelligence. I never thought about that. So you don't know no. one really. Yeah. And, uh, but obviously the average person, you know, they, they may not be grinding out a lot of soma, but they, uh -huh. they can see, they can right, hear, right, right. they can, you know. And so what is feeding that devata, that impulse of intelligence that, that causes their sense of sight to function? I think, oh, that makes, the, I, I think that we're just enables born. them to see and so on. I think that's just a gift that uh -huh. comes with birth, that that intelligence is there for us. Yeah. All right, so maybe we could say. Or if we're blind, but not. Yeah, just, based on your experience, maybe we could say that, um, the intelligence is there, which enables us to see, but if we want the sight to become really sublime and refined uh -huh. and, and see everything as a self and engulf everything mm -hmm. in love and all that, then there has to be some kind of subtle nourishment or subtle enlivenment of that intelligence. It, it, it helps support that experience, right. yeah. And love, love is, a, is a, big, you know, a big player in all this. Right. Um, it, it might be worth interjecting that the way Maharshi outlined it, um, there would be self-realization first, and as you described, and then there would be the growth of the heart, and then it would generally sort of go in that sequence. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that was like six month courses in Switzerland and all. And 75, 76, 75, yeah. 76. And, and the other thing that I began to experience is that my body was in me. I was no longer in my body. Uh -huh. so, so I would feel almost like when I walked, sometimes it was. This will sound silly, but I felt like I would be taking a dog out on a leash or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That the body, you know, the body came along, uh -huh. but my body was in me. I was not in my body. Yeah. Anymore. I was I was in my body, but I was also everywhere. Yeah, it's interesting to dwell on that one because you know a lot of people think, well, I, I am my body. Uh -huh. This is me, and when it dies, I'm gone. Uh -huh. And other people think, well, yeah, there's some kind of more essential, deeper thing that somehow dwells in my body, and that's uh -huh. me. You know, some little person in there someplace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what you're saying is that what you really are, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure you would say what everyone really is, is something much more vast, universal, mm -hmm. unbounded, and that, you know, rather than the body containing the self, the self, in the truer sense of it, mm -hmm. contains the body and everything else. I mean, it probably contains the chair as much right, as it contains right, right, the body, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a popular notion that I think Marianne Williamson or somebody coined, which is that, uh, you know, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human, human experience. Absolutely. And I think this kind of gives a new flavor to that. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. You know, we're, we're universal spirit taking functioning as a Taking our bodies for a walk. Yeah, right. Taking our bodies for a walk. Functioning, so as, <laughs> functioning as human beings. Yeah. yeah. Huh. But you, did you still feel a, a kind of a a sense of personhood at that point, even though, you know, there was this big self containing the body. I mean, obviously you had preferences. When you went to lunch, you took this food rather than that food and, and so on. Ice cream, plenty of that. <laughs> yes, alongside that was a lot, a lot of, I would say, emotional purification. Uh -huh. So there would be expansion and then there would be, you know, waves of, of tremendous purification because, you know, I had been, I had had a lot of depression and anxiety yeah. and you know, uh, yeah, I really wasn't in very good shape when I was young, and so a lot of that. So, so whatever of whatever basis for that there was, mm -hmm. had to be released, and it did get released. You know, and, get and what was that process? Were you like crying a lot or something? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but then that would big weep. That would come in big waves, and then you'd and then would, the wave would clear, and then you'd feel all groovy again. Yeah, and okay. and most of the time, I, I noticed that even when the the sadness would come, I always witnessed the sadness. Uh -huh. I was never absolutely, totally lost in the sadness. Right. There was some silent, unaffected... Right. But I was still weeping. Yeah. You know. Sure. How about anything really extreme? I mean, did you ever, like, injure yourself in such a way that it was extremely painful or 
anything like that, or have to, I don't know, have a tooth drilled, or so something that, that caused great pain that caused you to actually lose that witnessing, or was it just in, unperturbable once it was established? The memory is a bad, it's a bad yeah. thing. <laughs> I think, just curious. I, I think what happens with the witnessing is it just becomes how you are. Yeah. So you don't go looking for it. Right. You think, well, do I st am I still that? But it just becomes such a natural way of being. Yeah. So I think once I looked for it, it was never lost. Right. Huh. That's interesting. Once you looked for, for it. Yeah. If, if I looked for it, I would become aware of it. In other words, there it is. Yeah. 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 But I, you know, you just live life. You don't go around thinking, oh boy, I'm witnessing. Yeah. You know, you no, just, yeah. of course not. I sometimes like to use the analogy of a tone, that pretend it's a tone, not, not mm -hmm. consciousness. And if there was this tone going all the time, just a quiet tone, uh -huh. you wouldn't always hear it because you'd be busy doing other things, you know. But uh -huh. if any time you chose to, you could say, oh yeah, there's the tone. Uh -huh. you know, it's still there, hasn't gone yeah. away. But I remember one time, you know, something had happened, I'd had some interaction that on, on, was on, towards the end of the six month course, and I was just crying my eyes out. I mean, I was really in like emotional pain. And at the same time, I was witnessing it. Yeah. And and part of me was saying, "This is weird." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you could have both things going at the same time, but I did. Yeah. There was stillness, and then there was crying. <laughs> Actually, a lot of people I've interviewed say that yeah. after their awakening, all hell broke loose for a while. A lot of stuff right. started getting released, oh which was all bottled up beforehand. Right. But then, and after awakening, they had the capacity to allow it to release mm -hmm. more readily, or something. Right. Right. Yeah. We huh. couldn't stop it. It's so good or another yeah, way. Yeah, had no choice anymore. <laughs> yeah. Huh. The, the waking down people have what they call the wake down shakedown. Wake down shakedown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, all right. So you you med did long meditations for a year and went all through all this profound transformation, and then you had to come back to the United States. Right. All right. So what happened then? Oh, you know, more teaching. Yeah. <laughs> more teaching. More projects. Um, Trying to remember. Did you find that this kind of the richness and wholeness of the experience that had developed over there on the six on the one year course uh, was sustained when you came back, just the way witnessing had been stabilized for since for seventy four? For a while that you know, that, that sense of vastness and you know, being the body being in me, that was very clear for a while and then you know, you get tired and, and you lose some of the vividness yeah. of the experience. Uh -huh. Absolutely. I'd, I'd say oh I let's see it went in. Yeah, it just, you know, it, it did dim some. Yeah. yeah. And then what, you'd probably go on some other course and it would the, it, it's like clarify the again. Right, the witnessing was remained, but, but the, you know, the sort of ecstatic expansion part, yeah. that became less. Well, was there, was there a practical value to that? I mean, would it render you any less effective in activity to have all that ecstatic expansion going on? I mean, no, I think especially if you're teaching. I mean, you're teaching you're very inspirational to people yeah. when you're in that place. But if you're like, you know, making phone calls and doing bookkeeping and all that stuff, um, you know, would ecstatic expansion be a plus or a minus? <laughs> oh, it's always a plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, you get on the phone and yeah. you just cheer people up. You end yeah. up making jokes with them, you go to the grocery store, you drive with the people, you yeah. know. <laughs> True. You become a source of cheering people up. <laughs> all right, so we're still in the 70s. Um, and then the, then the flying thing came. Flying thing, okay. How was that for you? And we'll, you might as well explain what flying thing means. Um, well, Marshi started to teach uh, the Yoga Sutras, and one of the ones that he taught was flying. And interestingly enough, when I had been on the six-month courses, he had asked me of all, we had started studying these, um, these sutras, these um, processes for enlivening consciousness in, in every aspect of life, so that it wasn't just an awareness, it was there for you all the time, everything that you did, everything that you thought. And he had asked me of all the sutras that I had, you know, known about which one did I want most, and I said flying. I said, oh, Marcia, I've always wanted to fly. And within two days, it Came was offering, yeah. <laughs> so it's your fault. <laughs> but anyway, it took me a while to, um, I had to go home and then, you know, save up the money again and go take the next course. Yeah. And, um, I think that after I got the sutras, I, then I, I think I began to, I, they didn't cheer me up. Hmm. What'd they do? Um, I think then stressing became 
more became dominant. By stressing, you mean purification? By purification, yeah. more, more, more. In, it's like I fell back into um, life; just became difficult. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah. And uh, so, did you keep doing them, or did you? So, oh yeah. 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 Did you pass through that difficulty, or did you? Did you? Was it still difficult as long as you kept doing them? It just kept. You no, know, I have. Kept, I have faith. You know, I have faith in the along. process. Yeah. yeah, and so I, you know, I kept doing them, mm -hmm. and I mean, I went through time of being so just broke and poor and mm. I mean it was like it was like it was as if all the the ways that life had supported me in the past just mm. fell away instead of jumping in it was life pretty much fell apart really mm. and um, you know on, on the surface level right. but on the inner level the, the witnessing that I really really truly never lost right. but but I but life just became extraordinarily difficult and extraordinarily challenging um, I ended up coming to MIU, I think, and being on the CEG program. Marshy International University in Fairfield, Iowa. Yes. CEG means you were on a staff position. It was like it was a an staff study kind of thing. It was a ma we were able to to earn a master's degree. We would help run the university during right. the day, and then at night courses. we would theoretically yeah. take classes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I wonder if this might have been some kind of dark night of the soul thing that you often read about in the spiritual literature. Or People have some glorious awakening, and then they'll go into a blue funk for a yeah. while. You know. Yeah. Um, it could have been. I don't. Or mm. I. I don't. Uh, life really wasn't fun. Yeah. It was okay, but it wasn't fun. I. You know. I. I. When I was on CEG, life kept handing me teaching jobs. Right. I got to teach the staff the, a, a knowledge program for the staff, and and this and that. And I love. I love. I always loved teaching. Teaching was just always a gift for me, and I loved the knowledge. But I'd say my personal life just felt like blah. Hmm. You know, there, there wasn't, it didn't yeah. feel like life was supporting me. I felt like I'd entered into a period of poverty from which I might never emerge. Not just <laughs> financial poverty, but some kind of emotional poverty or, well, I don't know, other kinds of poverty as well? Like, yeah, it was, it was like nothing came easily. Yeah. Nothing, nothing in, in everyday life came yeah. easily. It was just all about Ringo work. Ringo Starr wrote a song about Oh, that. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> maybe it was just one of those phases, huh. you know. So how did you come out of it eventually? Let's Presuming see. you did. Oh, you know, there was the next project and the next project. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually I joined, um, in 1970, in 1972, at a, a course for TM, a rest course for TM teachers, Marshy had brought up the idea of, of, of monks and nuns. Oh, right. You know, non-sectarian monks and nuns, but we would be celibate and we would just right. live a life of service. And I signed up lickety-split. Mm -hmm. I really wanted that. And he never discouraged me, though he did discourage a lot of women. Mm -hmm. And so when he finally came up with a program called um, Mother Divine, and uh, how many heads for Purusha? Anyway, thousand heads of Mother Divine, so many right. heads of Purusha, I thought this was it, you know. And, and I, at the time, I was... Um, uh, in South, in, in a, on an all women's program anyway in South Fallsburg, and then we all went to India to teach TM, which was a whole amazing experience. Yeah. Um, you finally got your India fix. Well, the thing, the thing that was interesting was that you, you enter into a society that is totally non-linear. Yeah. And you, you, you realize that you are in control of nothing, which I think is the great lesson that humanity is learning now. Uh -huh. You are in control of nothing. Uh -huh. And if, if here's the goal and here you are, there are no straight lines between you and anything. You have to like cycle in and hope that you come anywhere near the goal of what you're gonna do. You know, it was it was just letting go, man. It was yeah. it was really it was a huge experience uh, of of that. And you know, then of course I got sick and everything too. But um, I will say I had a very interesting experience, which I'd like to share. Sure. My my sense of of the future, you know, there's a lot of talk about you know the year of 2012, 2012 and what's happening. I, I, I am absolutely convinced that we are, you know, well into, you know, coming into a period of, of huge light-based life for humanity. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to happen because anybody convinces anybody else that one paradigm is right and another paradigm is wrong. I just really believe that there's, a, like, like it's going to be the hundredth monkey thing where there's, there's a certain amount of consciousness and then everybody flips. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience teaching in India. Um, it was very, very challenging to set up a course. You know, again, it was the nonlinear thing. 
people would say, uh, oh, yes, madam, we'll help you, no problem. <laughs> and then you get to the place where the lecture is supposed to be all set up and the door is locked and nobody's done anything. You know? Indian mentality. <laughs> So I'm well aware of it. In, you know, Indians say, oh, yes, no problem. I, no, I will have it tomorrow. You know, and then <laughs> nothing. You, nothing happens. They just say it. They don't like to say no, yeah. so they say yes, but it doesn't mean anything. So <laughs> one, one place we were really trying to set up, of course, was in this medical school in, uh -huh. in Jaipur. And we you know, run into every roadblock and crazy situation you could. And finally, I was talking to this one man. He was our last best hope. Mm -hmm. Now, Two of the members of my team, we had a team of four, had gone into silence and they weren't helping us at all. <laughs> and, and the other member of my team was sick, so uh -huh. it was basically me. Right. <laughs> and so I'm talking to this professor, he's the last possible person, and I'm sitting in a, I remember sitting in a really huge room with him. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it was a class, empty classroom or something, and he's saying, no madam, sorry, not possible, in so many different ways. Right. Out of nowhere, and, I, and I, will, I, I do not pretend to know what this was, I heard a huge clap uh -huh. know, in the environment. Huh. And he switched Interesting. from saying, no, madam, not possible, to how can we set this up. Huh. And he did not remember. He didn't hear the clap. He did not hear the clap. It was just a clap. subjective thing for you? I don't know. Tape recorder in the room wouldn't have picked it up? Huh. No, I, I don't have no idea. Huh. But it was like this huge, really loud cracking sound. Huh. And, and then and he, he changed on a dime, and he, and he did not remember that four seconds ago he was saying no. Yeah. And he switched to saying yes. Interesting. And I feel like that's what can happen to human consciousness. Yeah. When, when there's enough light, we just wake up one morning, and we forget that we didn't like each other. You yeah. know, all Muslims, oh my God, they're the nicest people in the world. <laughs> Those Christians, they can't do enough yeah. for you. You know, it's just, it's just you know, more uh, on that level of... Mm. It'll just happen. Yeah. So I think that was a real gift for me to, to, to see, see how that. that could happen. And I, I mean, I was aghast. I'm, I was, and of course, I didn't remind him right. or say, are you sure? Yeah. I just said, oh, great, you know, let's go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and we did end up being able to teach there. <laughs> yeah. Huh. That's neat. I wonder what actually happened. I will never know, but it was, yeah. it was something. <laughs> huh. So uh, how long did you stay in India? That time, I think we stayed for four months. Hmm. Get amoebas and all that. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a whole other thing, you know, to work through. <laughs> yeah. Some friend of mine said he went to India expecting the bottom to fall out of his world, and instead the world fell out of his bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved, I loved teaching in India. You know, it was yeah. just, it was wonderful. I didn't mind the challenges, and, and uh, it cool. was great. So, uh, so that was late seventies or some some such thing, early eighties. That would have been, um, yeah, it was right around 80, 81, I think, hmm. when we all went to teach. So moving along, what else, do you, I mean, what's the next significant thing that really kind of comes to mind in your story? And then I came, I, I went on this program just for women. Mother Divine, right. Which, which I thought would be very fulfilling and really um, was very difficult. Yeah. Um, I, will, I not, won't go into it. <laughs> but it was very, very difficult, but it was also very strengthening uh -huh. to be able to, you know, meditate that much and... Um, my family went through a horrendous crisis. Your family, like your parents or something? Yeah, yeah. and that of course affected me and yeah. uh, I, I ended up releasing some deep stuff. <laughs> <laughs> very, very difficult time, uh, you know. And I'm very glad that I was on Mother Divine when I went through all this because yeah. I didn't have any responsibilities. So in other words, what your parents were going through, or was this unrelated to your parents, the deep stuff? It was, it was, it, it triggered. Yeah, it triggered something. Yeah, it was a fact. And so, so this is kind of reminiscent of what you said a little while ago where you were on this course and you, a lot of purification took mm -hmm. place. Now you're saying some even deeper stuff. Oh, deeper. Yeah, Deep, deeper stuff. <laughs> capital. This, this, this was, this was the kingpin, the yeah. kingpin issues. So they came up and I, and, and, and I often, you know, sometimes Marisha used to use the analogy when the sheet, the whiter the sheet gets, whatever spots yeah. remain show up more vividly. Uh -huh. So it was like you, Mother, Mother Divine wasn't easy. You, it was, yeah. it was self-confrontation all the time. Yeah, and perhaps inter-confrontation. Uh, right, right, and then you know, get a bunch of crazies all in one place. Right, right, and you're all <laughs> stressing on each other. And we right. had these groups of ten. It was like being married to ten people instead yeah. of one. You know, yeah. and um, but it, it was boy, the the stuff really hit huh. the fan for me personally. So, and I, what does that mean exactly in terms of actual concrete experience? I mean, what were you experiencing? 
hallucinations or no, or just the emotional upheavals. Intense, or? such intense fear. Fear. Okay. You know that I, I, I'm lucky I didn't, you know, go crazy. Huh. You know, it was by God's grace. Was it really. sort of an abstract, amorphous fear, like just fear no, without, fear. or were you fear afraid of this, that, and the other thing? It was amorphous. It was just yeah. being taken over by fear, being taken over by, you know, intense pain and sadness, and mm. I mean, it was it was big yeah. stuff, and it was. Fortunate that I was on Mother Divine doing that because right. again I didn't had I had to go to work yeah. or something during that time I don't think I. Well, it, it probably wouldn't have happened if you were going to work. Yeah, you know? right, I mean, right. it, it wouldn't have been allowed to get yeah. stirred up. And I think another thing that that loosened it all up was we used to get um, an Ayurvedic uh, purification process called Panchakarma, which mm -hmm. was also very powerful. Yeah. And we would give these treatments to each other, and I think that also really helped to stir it up. up. Yeah. But. Um, it, w it was a very... Hmm. How long did the fear phase last? Well, the worst of it lasted for months, several months. Day and night? Pretty much, yeah. Huh. So you were just walking around... Fear and pain, both yeah. together. Physical pain, like that you could isolate, yeah, or just emotional. kind of emotional? Well, actually, yes, there was a physical... It, it, uh, my back got so bad huh. that I couldn't move. There were times when I was just out flat. You know, and so that if I needed to use the bathroom, I had to roll off the bed, and oh. and you know, it was way beyond the reach of ibuprofen. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it so there was a physical component as well. Yeah, you know, it, was, it was very intense. That's interesting. Do you see this as having been essential in some way that this crap was down there and it really just had to be oh, ro yeah. rooted out? It had to go. And there was probably no uh, easy way, easier way for it to go. I don't know, but that's, it had to yeah. go, that's for sure, and yeah. I'm, grateful. I'm, I'm grateful that it came up, that I was able to work through it and let it go, yeah. and, and um, it made me a much more compassionate person, yeah. much more compassionate yeah. person. Because you can understand what people go I through. I never yeah. had really understood how painful yeah. this can be. And so, um, did it eventually, obviously it did, it, it eventually dissipated, mm -hmm. and the sun started to break through the clouds, right, 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 right. birdies started the to birds sing. Started to, yeah. <laughs> And I had some really good health. You know, I, I um, was using craniosacral therapy mm -hmm. and acupressure, acupuncture, and those were both tremendously yeah. helpful to me. Huh. And um, so you eventually left this program. Did, did it all kind of clear up before you left, or, after, or did, did you just leave and then it cleared up? In large part, it cleared up. And By far the worst if it was over. I thought yes. it was all over, but most uh -huh. of it, but, but it turned out there was another layer, but that came later on. But yes, it, it made it possible for me to leave the program. Right. Made it possible, meaning you couldn't have left in the midst of this, that's what you mean. You wouldn't well, have wanted to step out in the world while you were in this fear phase. It gave me the self-knowledge, knowledge about who I was and who I really wanted, what I really wanted from life. Oh, I see. So what you're saying is that having gone through this um, catharsis with all the fear, then when that kind of cleared up a bit, uh, an awareness dawned in you of what your calling was or what your purpose was or something. More about how I really wanted to, how live, you wanted live, to live life. life. I didn't want to be a nun right. anymore, uh -huh. you know. Um, it, so, so being freed of those, it, those tremendous emotions that had really been running my life for most of my life, you yeah. know, and whether we call them belief systems or emotional constructs or charges, once they were released, then I could, you know, I was free to, 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 to you know, discover who, you know, yeah. more about myself. So did you feel at that stage that an intuition was guiding you to sort of do this and go that way and, you know, explore that? And you were kind of becoming more kind of a free and experimental as opposed to following a, a, an external uh, well, prescription for how you should live? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I became. I, I began to be, have the courage to be myself. Right. You know, or not even the courage, the freedom to be myself. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, w once once those fears, you know, fear just ties you up in knots. You yeah. know, and you think you have to follow a formula and do this and do that. And uh, once I let go of, of that fear and the basis for that fear, which had really run my life for uh, most of my life, without you even knowing it. With, it absolutely, right. you don't know it. You know? <laughs> And, uh, and and then I began to be able to, you know, it's very difficult to leave a, a, the life of an enclosed nun that you've been on for seven years. You know, yeah. you've been, and you've always, you've meditated with the same group of people for seven years. You're like one body. Right. And then to, to think about how you're going to go out in the world and 
you know, and, and, and support yourself right. even, you know. I mean, I left with two boxes of books and a suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't come to, to Fairfield. I knew that I wanted to be in the world. I went to Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. So um, did you find that once you became more kind of independent in your thinking and in terms of the, the things you wanted to pursue, that you didn't fit so neatly into the TM world anymore? Or into the TM movement world anymore? Into the Mother Divine world. The Mother Divine world. Yes. Well, that's a very... Yes, yes. Th that's a pretty precise niche. I began to... I would say it was, it was, it was a tremendous process of self-empowerment, mm -hmm. of, of knowing that, knowing that um, I had to be myself. Right. I, ha I remember I did, of, of, of giving myself permission to know myself, and to be myself and to operate as myself, mm -hmm. my version of the infinite. Yeah. Were you um, engaging in any kind of courses or seminars or anything that talked this way? You know, I mean, there are seminars that you know teach I, people how to do that sort of thing, or was it just your own initiative? That at that time, um, I, I was learning to uh, learning craniosacral therapy mm -hmm. and acupressure, and I did get a lot into. And, and I took courses on that. In fact, I, I treated people on Mother Divine. And mm. they, they welcomed what I had learned. And I think it was more in helping people, not another teaching, mm -hmm. but helping people to release the emotions, the belief systems, the constructs, the, the charged energies that they held inside so that they could become their authentic selves. Huh. So that was the thing, to, to address, you know, rather than just meditating and hoping for yeah. the best. <laughs> You know, to, 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 to address those things head on. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting because a little while ago you were talking about a phase in which you felt like there really wasn't a self. You know, there wasn't right. any sort of inner identity. You know, there was no one home in some sense. And now you're talking a lot about, you know, becoming your authentic self and doing what you really want to do and all that. It seems a little bit paradoxical. It, it is paradoxical because there's still no sense of doing inside. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the, the personality... They both exist. It's, it's like they run in tandem. Yeah. You know, they, they run in tandem. There, there's, there's the self that doesn't do, and the self that has no limits, mm -hmm. and then there's and then there's the person in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there was still a very strong person in the world, and there was a huge, humongous amount of purification. Right. And I, I'm so grateful that I had that stable basis mm -hmm. on which to, the for the world. flood, for the floods to. Yeah. <laughs> For the floods to flood, but because it was it was very deeply challenging, and there may have been times during that period when I, when I lost the witnessing. I don't I don't remember because it was such a humongous emotional hodgepodge. Hmm. Yeah. I heard a quote recently from Nisarga Data, which I'll probably mention in several mm -hmm. interviews until I get tired of mentioning it, in which he said that uh, said that the best measure of enlightenment is the the degree to which you're comfortable with paradox, ambiguity, and uh, what was the other word? I don't know, not, maybe uncertainty, some other word, uh, arbitrary, and yeah. some, one of those kind of things. There are no absolutes in the relative. Right. <laughs> and yet, the, you know, a yeah. large percentage of people in this world try to create them or to yeah. hold on to them for the sake of security. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, you know I'm absolutely con convinced that this political perspective or this religious uh -huh. practice or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, because they feel more secure, you know, holding on yeah. tight to such a thing. But it's really not security because it's always under assault mm -hmm. by all the things which contradict it. Which, yeah. you know, which you could, if you could actually step into those perspectives, it would be equally true from those perspectives. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> there, you know. It's all true and none of it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it seems ironic, but um, you know, uncertainty is a much more secure place to be than That's certainty. That's right. <laughs> and I'm really in a place that I can honestly say I know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you, you flew the coop, you went to Washington, D.C., and, and you were doing, were you a professional cranial sacral I started to person? do cranial sacral therapy, and I also did uh, West, Western astrological charts. Okay, you had learned how to do that. I had, I had learned how to do that when I was 18, mm -hmm. and I'd always loved it, and uh, I revived that, and that also, that was a very valuable tool uh, for me learning to understand the human psyche. Because the Western system is very oriented towards, you know, personal healing and personal growth and, yeah. and, and that kind of more psychological approach. So, and I also was teaching TM. Mm -hmm. The teaching thing for me has always been very strong. 
and the, you know, it, it's just this is the hugest, a, a consistently huge gift. And I started teaching the, the TM technique, you know, magically almost in the, in the international development world. Huh. Uh, and I just kind of waltzed in. Meaning like diplomats and people uh, like that? World, the World Bank, uh. the International, uh, the IMF, uh -huh. PAHO, um, the International Development Bank, the, the African Development Bank. I just wandered in there like it was home. Mm. <laughs> and it was almost like wandering in there. And I was very, very dedicated to the idea of uh, getting the whole international development community to change their development paradigm. Right. Single-handed, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because what I saw was that when they would go into countries, mm -hmm. they would the first thing they would do was to, be, to try to rebuild the economic infrastructure, put in the roads and the railway lines and all that kind of thing, so that people could create an economy. But clearly, if you build a railroad and you build a road and you don't change people's internal strength and creativity and motivation, the railroad's going to collapse, and the road's going to go go to heck. And so, so I was I wanted them to bring some balance, yeah. and to and so I, I taught TM like crazy there. Hmm. Oh boy, I met the most wonderful people. That's great. That's what year was time. that? I keep asking you years, but I'm curious because I Let's taught see. in DC for a while, and I actually went into some of those places and set up group meditations. Did you? And there were people there who had been meditating, who got yeah. to do some group meditations on their lunch hour. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it would have been. I think I started in '88. 1988. That might have been after, that was after my time, so you did that after me. Yeah, and I just, I, it was my baby man, I focused on this That's thing. That's And, um, you know, I thought, I was determined that at least one country would adopt a group of 7,000 mm -hmm. and all that. And then at the same time, I was doing my own thing. I was doing craniosacral and yeah. Western astrology, you know, which was heretical. Mm -hmm. Cool. So. <laughs> did they give you any flack for doing that stuff? A certain, you? a certain individual did, yes. Yeah. Gave you a hard time about it. But well, what we're alluding to is that, you know, <laughs> within the TM movement, there are, you know, certain activities which aren't approved for a teacher to do, and if you do them, then you kind of begin to get some heat from yeah. the powers that be, or certain powers anyway. Huh. Anyway, so I did that. I was there for about five years, mm -hmm. and then I just was seriously wiped out, yeah. you know, just living in Washington, D.C. and all that. It's an and, intense place. And, and also working to support my work in the movement, yeah. which happens often. You know, you, 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 don't, you hardly make anything from teaching, right. and you perform all these services for all these wonderful people, and, and, um, and so you have to find a way to pay your bills. So I was pretty wiped out, so then I came here. Yeah, to Fairfield, Iowa. Yeah. Right. And um, that was the beginning of, of another big shift on the personal plane. Because, well, I did work continued to work for the movement for a while. I worked for John Hagelin's Institute. I maintained my contacts at the world, you know, in the international development community and tried to, you know, cultivate them and ended up being able to go and see Marishi with some people and all that kind of thing. But the, I reached the point where I just couldn't, I couldn't work in order to work for the movement anymore. Right. I was just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I actually quit my very last movement job. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge, it was a very difficult decision for me. Um, and it was just a huge, um, a huge transition. Mm. Because for the first time in uh, 28 years, I was started to have a personal life. Yeah. You know? And, uh, Even though I, there was no person. Right, but you know what I mean? I began <laughs> I to, what mean, to yeah. do what I wanted to do. I, yeah. you know, I'd earned just enough money to kind of pay my bills, and I spent hours wandering around in Jefferson County Park. I know, I was thinking that. Yeah. I often saw you there. <laughs> I, boy, did I bond with that part. We'd take our walks yeah. there with our dogs, and there you would be. I was always there yeah. every day. And it was like I was just giving myself permission to just be a person, mm -hmm. you know. And that was really a wonderful, wonderful period. Yeah. And during that period, some friends of mine um, began to study with a Native American man. Mm. Now, I had always been fascinated with, with Native American even stuff, even when I was a little girl. But I never really pursued it because I didn't think anybody would ever share anything with me. Why should they? You know? yeah, yeah. Well, this door opened. They had started studying with this man who lived up in Des Moines. And the door opened to study with him. And at first, I did not want to do that. Mm. There's no, you know, there, there was just no way I was going to do that. Uh, I was just letting loose of this teaching. I certainly didn't want to get involved in a whole other teaching. But we'll just say that, you know, again, it was one of those conspiracies of life mm. that I ended up um, going to teach with, going to study with him. And I'll tell you about a wonderful dream I had right before I started. And that was, um, 
I was standing, in the dream, I was standing in a door frame. It was absolutely empty. There was no door there, just a wooden door frame. And on one side of the door frame was a, a, a wooden room. You know, it had four walls on the floor, but it was absolutely empty, and it was old wood. I mean, it was empty, but it had four walls on the floor. And on the other side of the door frame was light. Oh, all the gorgeous white golden light you know you could ever want, but there was nothing to hold on to. So I was standing in that door frame, knowing that what was behind me was empty, and that where I needed to go was that, and I was afraid. But by the time I left off studying with that teacher, I had jumped. Hmm. The Indian teacher. The Indian teacher. The, uh, right. the, the guy in the mind. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, after all the decades of meditation and long, you know, uh, meditation courses and really deep stuff and profound s celestial experiences, uh -huh. and vast expansion, and all that stuff, you found some Native American guy in Des Moines who really had a lot to teach you. He did. Huh. And what he taught me was very, very important because I had chosen the most austere route through the TM movement. I mean, I was, a, you know, yeah. the nun and the, and the, and the full-time teacher and not looking to the left or to the right, service, service, service. Mm -hmm. And I needed to, to, to bring that all down and bring it into life. Huh. I needed to connect with the earth and to connect with life. And one of the things that he showed me and taught me was that everything that I had always thought you had to close your eyes to achieve, mm -hmm. they had the exact same goal, so to speak, and they did it all with their eyes open. Ah. So for instance, one of the exercises that we would do was we would go out into the woods, into these uh, places that he would prepare for us energetically, and we would sit there all night, even in the winter time, oh. and you know, do, doing various kinds of, you know, using different tools that he had given us, and we were not to close our eyes. Hmm. And I remember the first time he put me out in the woods, and I was sitting there in the woods with All my... All by yourself? Or? Oh, yeah, totally by myself. Wow. You know, by myself at night in the woods, and I thought, yes! <laughs> I'm doing spiritual work, and I'm in the woods, and my <laughs> eyes are open, yes! <laughs> That's great. So that was, that, that was good, and there was a huge, huge amount of growth from that, hmm. of learning, really, um, that all this is nothing but that, huh. you know. That, that all this is nothing but that. The whole absolute e being. Everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is being. Everything is essence. You didn't already know that. But it wasn't. But yes, but I wasn't living it. it I, mm -hmm. I had a long list of things that were good for me and bad for me. Right. And the truth is, everything just is. Uh huh. Everything just is. Nothing's good or bad. Everything just is. Which is not to say that you started knocking back a pint of whiskey every day. No, but I did eat meat, which was a huge deal for That's me. That's a big deal, yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, I can't really digest it, but I did, I did, so I mean, I, I ate it for a while and then backed off, but, right. but you know, I, ha I had to, to, to recognize that, you know, it, being, it's all being. Yeah. And everything just is. And then we make up stories about it, and we say it's good or bad, and we overlay interpretations. Yeah. And so we, we, it becomes that for us. We, we, we create a reality in which this is good and that is bad. Mm -hmm. Now, in relationship to food or whiskey or something like that, I let my body tell me what it wants. And yeah. so far it hasn't wanted any whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is sort of reminiscent yeah. of, the, of the way the waking down people go about it, which, in which they, you know, you know, many of them have... Uh, initially achieve some sort of mm -hmm. awakening, but it's not embodied, and so there's mm -hmm. a lot of emphasis on, it you know, living it uh, in a nitty-gritty way. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but I keep mentioning them just because I've interviewed about five or six of them. And so. And, and actually, in, in the healing work that has evolved inside me, that is what I help people do, is to bring their light into this physical form, yeah. and to live it, uh -huh. and, and, and to find it everywhere and in everything, mm. but, but really to ignite it in ourselves. Yeah. So it's not just a state of consciousness, up, right? but it's it's the whole body is nothing but light. Yeah. To transform that huh. body into light. How do you actually enable people to do that, or is that premature in this discussion? It's, I don't care. Okay, okay. we can get into it now, and then maybe <laughs> look, look back if we want to. Well, um, what the first thing that I do, th there was a real emphasis in the Native American program that I was involved in, in living in your heart. Mm getting out of your head and into your heart. And my teacher used to tell us all the time, um, oh, I, I will mention that th this man was not, in quotes, what we would call an enlightened man. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the great lessons for me in working with him was discriminating between, but he was very well, we could say, connected yeah. through ceremony, what was coming from God and what was coming from him. Mm -hmm. That was a huge and very valuable lesson. I, another lesson in self-empowerment and trusting yourself and not giving it all away to the teacher. Which I might add, in my opinion, yeah. is true of any teacher, no matter right. how um, lofty or exalted right, they may right. be. They've got personality, you know, they've got cultural you right. know, attitudes and personal uh -huh. inclinations and so on, which in some cases people take as all being divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't, personally I don't think that's necessarily the case, but that's maybe a side, yeah. a side discussion. <laughs> so what, what happened was, um, let's see, have I... I call, my, I call the, the, the work that I offer to people, I call it first light transformations because when we work together, we sit in the very first light or very expression of creation. Mm -hmm. And How do you get people to sit there? By resonance, because I, that's where I live. Uh -huh. So it and just so happens. Just, so being with you over, that's right. over a session, they kind of settle into that? It's immediate. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, and it's just, it's through resonance, yeah. that's all. And, um, and uh, the first thing I do is I get, I get to see the person as a soul, as a light. It's not about auras or anything like that, but just who, who they are as an impulse, as a divine impulse. And then, how, how does that appear? I mean, it shows uh, up. Just shows up in my awareness. Uh -huh. So does that happen uh, only when you're having a session with people, or does it happen in the supermarket checkout line? You kind of like pick up on something about each person. Sometimes that happens, but I definitely don't try. I cons would consider that very invasive. And I, I don't want to walk around knowing all that stuff about people. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to get my groceries and go home. <laughs> <laughs> so it, sometimes I'm just with people, and, you know, th there, there, there's a knowing, but there's no effort right, for that. Right, so when you have your sessions, it's more of a... I have permission. Intention. Yeah, you're saying... Yeah. yeah, the person's come for some help, and, sure. and I have permission. Okay. And then you can I do that with me, by the way, during this interview. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't I've been doing it already... <laughs> <laughs> and, th and then what I do is, is, is life gave me a technique for helping people to be in their hearts. Hmm. And what I find is that the heart is a kind of a portal for the truth of who you are and for your light. Huh. And all the stories are in the mind. So there's a really wonderful, it's a very simple technique, I call it the bowling ball technique, for bringing people into their hearts. And as soon as people are in their hearts, it's like they're l that light, the, 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 in the divine impulse, the impulse of divinity that we each are just shows up and it literally begins to infuse through the heart and fill the body. Hmm. Now, that is not something that I try to do. It's just, it's, I really don't do anything. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, lazy, no good. <laughs> Does that <laughs> happen with just about everybody that yes. you have this with? Yes. Yes, it Guarantee does. or your money back sort of thing? Well, I suppose, yeah. It'd be <laughs> fine with me if somebody really wanted it. <laughs> Yes, it, it, and then what happens is, if there are places where that light can't seem to suffuse, maybe there's a belief system there, mm -hmm. or an old emotion, an emotion or all that. And then I just have, based really on my old experience with craniosacral therapy, yeah. um, just everything is a metaphor, mm -hmm. you know, it's a metaphor, a way to release some of the old charges and the old belief systems, and very lovingly, yeah. very lovingly, because everything in life serves a purpose. And then the light can take over and take over and take over. Yeah. But the whole idea is for everybody to live the biggest version of themselves, right. the, the infinitely inspired version of themselves, and to come to a place where we live from our ins not from rules or belief systems, but jumping you know out of those empty rooms and into the light, and realizing that we are in control of nothing. So why so so give it up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> How many sessions does it take the average person to get this? There's usually a very, people, one of the other things that's very important for me is to not create any sense of dependency or any sense that I'm some great right, healer or anything. Need you in order to right, the, the, it, I, I feel like we're in a paradigm shift of universal spiritual empowerment where mm -hmm. everybody's supposed to discover how big their light is and how they can really take care of everything. Yeah. So consequently, people have a, a, a wonderful experience, and then they may not call me for six more months mm -hmm. or a year or something. You know, so that's. Someone suggested in one of my interviews that um, it's as time goes on, it's like the as as if membranes that that block the uh, realization of of this stuff 
are getting thinner and thinner. And like the way he put it was, you know, maybe the Buddha had to pierce a very thick membrane uh, in his day. Mm -hmm. to have his realization. So he was a sort of a real pioneer, a unique soul who had, you know, uh -huh. who was capable of piercing that. These days, that same membrane that he pierced is so much more, you know, so much thinner mm -hmm. that, you know, many, many people are having that kind of breakthrough. Yeah. And it's becoming more commonplace, which is actually one of the, it's kind of a theme with the name of this show, Buddha at the Gas Pump. You know, yeah. uh -huh. The implication being that people in everyday ordinary life uh -huh. are having that the kind of experience that was once considered to be a, a, Extraordinary and reserved for the most exalted souls, right, right, right. and so on. And uh, and now it's about Buddha at the gap from it. It's the paradigm shift is not is not not like just a single guru and a whole bunch of students, but everybody becoming yeah. that. And one thought, one question that comes to mind is: I mean, you spent years going through this really heavy stuff and doing all this really intense practice, and mm -hmm. you know, a year at a time of long, long meditations. Yeah. And all this deep garbage <laughs> coming out. Now, are you suggesting that the people whom you now meet with are experiencing comparable uh, progress or shifts as a result of a few little sessions that you do with them. Uh, you know that, that, that in other words, the membrane has gotten thinner and it's easier for people Absolutely. now to get the same thing that you had to spend all that money and time at. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I call our generation. I call us the mud sluggers. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Marsh used to say we were born at zero percent natural law, and I. So it's it's like we we had a slog through all the mud of all the craziness and all the dysfunctional families yeah. and all the density of human consciousness, and now it's so much easier huh. for people to make these breakthroughs. And I'm not saying that processing has no role. Sometimes certain things do need to be consciously processed, but now an awful lot can be accomplished just by turning on the light. Yeah. And I mean, on, on the flip side, a cautionary note is that I, I, I sometimes hear a lot of people saying that, well, you know, I realized who I am, and that's it, I'm done, you know, finished. And, yeah. and I, I really get the sense that there's a lot more progress yet to be made, but they're, they're kind of like, you know, uh -huh. taking the easy way and, and just yeah. sort of dumbing down the whole awakening process, you know, and, and failing to recognize that they're are indeed stratas and, right, and, right, and right. further progress and mm -hmm. you know, I don't think they'll be allowed to realize that, to see it that way forever because mm -hmm. nature would give them a kick in the pants. But, <laughs> you know. but yeah, but uh, just, just, to add, to, just to add the stuff about the so-called red path and, and the role that it... What's the red path? The, the Native American, okay. the, the Native Amer Native yeah. American teachings because okay. then I also went on to, to study with somebody else. Oh, I do care about that. Um, it was very important for me to integrate yeah. and to bring it all down to earth. And I, what I put on my website is I felt like every cell in my body turned around 180 degrees because I, I, was, I was bringing that light out into the world mm. and finding, finding infinity in the grain of sand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll give you an example. He, this, this teacher said that when he was very young, uh, he, it was known that he was, you know, had was gifted and special, so he was sent for special training, and um, he and he went went to be with his grandmother, mm -hmm. and his grandmother, he said, would send him out to look at a leaf every day, mm -hmm. and a little squirmy little boy, you know, so he would come in after an hour or two, and his grandmother would say, "What did you see?" and he would say, "Nothing." <laughs> <laughs> so a leaf. <laughs> right, but he said after six months, one day he was looking at the leaf, and it opened up. And the whole world was in that leaf. That leaf was fully transparent. Huh. So that's what I was learning. That you, you know, it, choose your path, whatever resonates with you. Yeah. You know, whatever whatever paradigm is most resonant with you, mm -hmm. you know, go go with that. But it's, yeah. it, it's it's all available, all around us. It's everywhere. It's who we are. All we need to do is remember it. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's not hard. It's 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 everywhere. It's just Seek and you shall it. find. That's right. Yeah. So so. Um, but that the, the whole Native American path has given me the ability to really, really live the infinite and to complete that whole process of evolution. Hmm. I also um, uh, became a sun dancer and I have a pipe. Sun dance, is that the thing where they hook the things? Yeah, but the women don't do oh, that. Oh, good. <laughs> be easier to hook, but on the other hand. What, one thing about Native American ceremony, if you, look, uh, if you can look at that, is that it's, it's not just a question of closing your eyes and transcending. Right. They participate fully, mind, emotions, and body in every ceremony. Yeah. So the whole human structure participates in ceremony. So when that light comes, it's not just 
in awareness. Right. The whole body gets transformed. The whole body gets permeated by light. Hmm. After the sun dance, I feel I, I can't even. It, it's like I'm just light. Cool. I'm just so so so. It, and it's because of, of bringing the whole physical participation in. You know, mm -hmm. the, you, you participate. The, every aspect of your humanity is is participates in the ceremony. Oh. So when you did the Sundance, it was a it was a watershed moment. Then you were you know transformed ever after as a result. Of I that? would say another big. Uh, I would say first of all, in my in my studies with the first teacher, there was a lot of focus on. Um, everyone has their own relationship with the Creator. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone you know nobody can tell anybody else what's right or wrong. Yeah. Everybody has their own relationship with the Creator, which we could say our own relationship with ourselves and our own knowing. And so our job is to clear away any belief systems that would keep us from, again, laying interpretations over what what wants to come through yeah. us. So there was more work on belief systems, and, and there was more purification. There was actually more to do, you know, yeah. I could say. I brought him a truckload, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but, but it was very, very liberating and really beautiful. I, I would say the next amazing thing that happened on that path was when I was given a pipe. And um, to explain to you the, what the pipe is for me, um, there was yet another ceremony where I received a Lakota name. It's called the making of a relative. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to, I, I had asked for the name, and then it took a whole year till the ceremony came about. And during that year, I kept running into snakes hmm. and wondering, well, what does this mean? I mean, even in San Diego, I ran into a rattler in a park in wow. San Diego. So I knew that snake was saying, hey, hey, you know, so I, you know, I asked different people, what does it mean, and I read the silly books and all that, but finally I got that for me, it was about molting, I was about to go through a big change. Well, there's a part in the ceremony where you're wrapped up in a Lakota star blanket, uh -huh. and then you, you, they give you your name, or you, you throw off the blanket, uh -huh. and I knew that as soon as I threw off the blanket, oh, I just molted, uh -huh. I, I'm letting go of who I used to be, and then they give you your name, and I'm starting to embody that name. Yeah. And then at the same moment, the um, the person who gave me the name, that the, the um, wonderful, wonderful chief from up in uh, in Eagle Butte, he he put his huge ceremonial pipe in my hand, mm -hmm. and when he put his pipe in my hand, this light came into my body and filled every cell in my body. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I, I'd had many experiences of light, really, you know, beautiful, transcendent light. And it was that same transcendent light, but it came with a, a strength. That's the only way I can explain it. Yeah. So that not only were you filled with light, but you were given the strength to live the truth yeah. of that light in this third dimensional world. Huh. So it was, it was so that you could live with integrity huh. and courage. And it was just, it changed everything in my body. Wow. It was really amazing. So was that sort of experience the predicted and intended uh, outcome of this particular ceremony? I mean, is it no. something that Native Americans are accustomed to having, mm -hmm. to seeing happen in people when they do this and give them no. a no. uh, So you know. did you explain to the man what had happened I to I told him? my teacher, so, yeah, he, 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 yeah. he wanted me to share it with other people. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, you got more of a whammy. I got a whammy. Yeah, yeah. I got a big fat gift. <laughs> And obviously, I mean, you've always had good experiences, yeah. and you, you've done a lot of preparation, right. which probably made you more mm -hmm. receptive to that kind of right, right. experience. I, I'm not sure if I'd experienced quite the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, do, I used to say, you know, if I hadn't been meditating, I wouldn't have understood the thing they were talking about. Yeah. So it was a Lay the ground. Good. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you said you had another teacher after the guy in Des Moines, the was that another Native American teacher? Right. That's the man right. who gave you the pipe. I see. Right. And he was up in... South Dakota. He's up in South Dakota. Right. I'm up at a Sunday out in South ah. Dakota. Interesting. So, um, does that pretty much bring us up to the present in terms of all the significant well, stages? No, of I, I would say the final stage uh -huh. was uh, I moved to New Mexico. Right. I was up in Des Moines studying with this guy for about four years, and then it took me about another year and a half to figure out what the next step was. Uh -huh. And then I went to, to San Diego for seven months mm -hmm. to study with the healer, and then I moved to New Mexico. And when I moved to New Mexico, I thought, oh boy, you know, great people, great life, it's yeah. going to be. But that's not what God had in mind. Uh. It was a, my time in the desert. It was, it was a period of very, very deep silence. Um, 
about me and it was me and the earth and God. Yeah. Many days I didn't talk to people. You were just in a fairly secluded I, area. Yes, I yeah. could barely. I couldn't make. God didn't let me make friends. Huh. Uh, I, you know, I could. I barely had enough work to survive. I ended up making jewelry. So I'd sit and string beads for hours, and uh -huh. it was great fun. I called it living in the content-free zone. Yeah. But it was a period of really, um, you know, letting go of the very, very, very last belief systems. Hmm and all sense of having any control over my life whatsoever, yeah. you know. It was it was just a final, final, final emptying out so that truly on no level was anybody home, mm -hmm. nor would anybody ever be home again. Huh. So was it the silence of the desert that helped you do that or the sort of, uh, I don't know? The willingness. I think oh. willingness plays a huge role in evolution, just willingness yeah. to just um, see the gifts that God is laying before you hmm. and uh, surrender to those gifts, even if it's not what you expect or what you wanted. Yeah. You know, if somebody had told me I was going to move to New Mexico and not have any friends and not have any work, yeah. and I, you know, so, so I tried hiking because I love to hike, uh -huh. and I, this was my first day out on hiking, I sprained my ankle. Yeah. I wasn't even allowed to hike. You know, hike yeah. I was just supposed to, you know, be still and know God. Right. And um, so it was, it was a, a, a beautiful period, challenging period. Yeah. Um, but at the end of it, it was really complete. It seems like your um, that I call that the final huh. whatever. It seems like your life has cycled between periods of intense activity, like teaching at the World Bank uh -huh. in Washington D.C., uh -huh. and then periods of deep silence for a long time, and then another period right. of intense activity. It's gone through these cycles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when, oh, go ahead. No. Oh, well, I was going to say. So when you say that it, it's the end of it, finished. I mean, maybe well, you maybe no, can elaborate on that a little bit. Well, there, what's what's it, so final about that? This particular on no, stage. On of, no level is anybody home. And and I. So know, if I whack your finger oh, with well, a yes. hammer or something like that, does somebody come but home I have and a body. say, "Ah"? <laughs> I, no, no, yeah. I, I have a body. But in terms of my identity, is I would I would say that it's just pure transparency. And mm -hmm. and. Um, Explain to people why why you would consider that a desirable thing. Because some people, when they hear those kind of words, they, they don't like the sound of it. They yeah. feel like you're being robbed of something precious, uh, that you know, you've, been, you've had the soul sucked out of you or something like oh, that. Oh, you're absolutely free. I mean, you, there, <clears throat> there are no definitions. There are no shoulds. There are no shouldn'ts. There are no oughts. There's <clears throat> only you know, the inspiration of the moment. And you know, we could say letting life live you yeah. instead of feeling like you have to be in control of life. You have no opinion. I have no opinions. Do you vote? I do vote. So you have an opinion there. But it's not an opinion. And if you it's go a, to a it's, restaurant, it's, and you it's, it's a, choose this thing over that yes, thing. Yes, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a feeling, you know. Yeah. Like, I really like this guy, you know. Right. And it's a, so it's not, it's not a fixed opinion that I'm right and everybody's wrong. There's just my knowing that this is this what is I want to vote for. This is for you. Yes. Yeah. So when you say you have no opinions, you mean in the sense that, you know, some people have an opinion. For instance, they say, gay marriage is wrong. Yeah. And those people are going to hell. And and you're like probably more kind of like live and let live, whatever like totally, whatever yes. is people are inclined to do it's Right, because cause, cause again it's it's being in a place where life just is. Life is just being itself. Mm -hmm. And um, there's nowhere where I am not mm -hmm. and life is just being itself. So um, yes, I'll go into a restaurant and I'll you know, and, and there are you know things that I like and don't like, um, and if you step on my toe, I will say ouch. <laughs> you know, but but you, you it's, but in terms of, of my my reality, there are no limits to that. Mm. There's no, and and I and, and I have no sense that anything is true, or untrue. Mm. Everything just is. But still, you have preferences. I mean, you would you would sort of. Well, I'll just play with this a little. For okay. A minute. Um, <laughs> for instance, you would—I don't know—if we had a, 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 a modern-day Hitler uh, and a modern-day Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. you would probably feel that the Mother Mother Teresa person is, you know, deserving of support and encouragement and and, and whatnot. Whereas the Hitler guy needs to be stopped somehow, or uh, you know, he's doing something harmful, and and there should be some corrective action. Am I? What I feel is that it's all in God's hands, mm -hmm. and I, you know, in terms of the economics, politics, and all that, 
it's not, I, it's like I am the universe, mm -hmm. but I'm not God, so to speak. Right. You know? and, and I feel like everything is unfolding exactly as it should. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have to fix anything. Right. And that it's, everything is, is just being taken care of. Now, if everybody felt this way, would, every, would the whole society be sort of wishy-washy, apathetic, sort of like, oh, whatever, you know, and nothing would get done? I mean, no, or in your specific life, I mean, do you have plenty of motivation and determination to do things? Um, if I had a choice, I would, uh, you know, if I could do absolutely anything at this point, mm -hmm. I would just kind of walk and talk my way around the world and go right. around meeting people and uh -huh. experiencing different cultures. I mean, if I was economically, yeah. you know, wealthy, that's what I would do. Just, just interact with people, learn from them. Maybe they would learn from yeah, me. I think I would too. I'd like yeah, buy an it. RV and just kind of drive around. <laughs> yeah, that, that nice would place. be it. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, in terms of, yeah, I mean, and there you have it, you know, something that feels right. But it's like impulses come, and they, and they, they, don't, they don't come from a sense of an individual trying to find fulfillment. Right. They just come as, okay, and, and, and the impulse moves you. You don't even have the thought, I should do this or I should do that. You just find yourself doing that. So, so it's like the, the intellect with all its complexity just pl plays a much more background role. Yeah. And you're, you know, and you live from here. So in other words, the fulfillment is there. Yes. You're fulfilled whether or not you do this, this, or this. Right, right. But, you know, impulses come and that they motivate you to do this, this, yeah. or this, you know. Right. Or this instead of that. And, yeah, right. And so on. Right. Yeah. But... But the, the completion or fulfillment of this particular project is your your, your fulfillment is not contingent upon that. It's, no, it's not. It's going to be there. Up, up, yeah. yeah, upon doing anything. And and when you when you're doing certain things that you know really take a, uh, a fair amount of gumption or determination to accomplish, mm -hmm. do you do you muster that up and you you you're kind of focused and working hard and, and so on, or have you found that you're a little bit more laid back and? Neither. Neither. I'm just I'm just present. No. So whatever present. is appropriate, whatever is called for. Right. I'm just present doing yeah. whatever it is I find myself yeah. doing or find myself moved to do. Yeah. I guess the reason I'm pursuing this line of questioning is that, you know, there, people have a tendency to try to define awakening in terms of some external criteria. Uh -huh. And they often, um, you know, either glorify or, um, or criticize it based on external criteria. You know, saying, oh, the person is so perfect and nothing, they, can, uh -huh. they couldn't possibly do anything wrong. Or they might say, oh, well, they're wishy-washy, they don't have convictions, you know, they're, uh -huh. they're just, uh, you know, going with the flow way too much. And so I'm kind of probing, <laughs> probing a little bit to sort of see, the, uh -huh. you know, the reality of the situation uh -huh. and how, um, as I suspect, it's, in, it's not incompatible with practical life. Oh, it's totally, you know, it's, I don't see how it, it's, it's, no, it's not incompatible with practical life. You know, yeah. I pay my bills and I work, right. and you know, and all that kind of stuff. But um, it, it, it's just um, life just is, and life just unfolds, and it doesn't take courage or lack of courage. Right. You just, you're just present. You just find yourself doing what life, with a capital L, has you to do. I, I, I really feel like each of us is, you know, we, we're both. The total, we're both the, o the the ocean and the wave. Okay, right. we're, and we're each very different. Um, it's it's like the, the infinite is exploring different possibilities of its own nature in each of us. Mm -hmm. So, Nancy's version of, in quotes, enlightenment or perfection, is going to look one way, and yours is going to look another way, and mine is going to look another way. You know, a rose becomes a perfect rose, and a peony becomes a perfect peony, and a daisy becomes a perfect daisy. Yeah. And so we each, we just need to find our own version of perfection. Mm -hmm. And some people, w without a doubt, will be leaders and dynamic and, you know, ha have, a, have a mission, but they'll just know it. Yeah. They'll know it and they'll do it. Mm -hmm. And other people will be more about, you know, less dynamic and some people will be zero dynamic, you know, yeah. but and everything in between. So there's no one version. Right. There's only each of us needs to find, uh, you know, f find our own, be our version of, mm -hmm. it, of the infinite. Yeah. There's all that talk in Bhagavad Gita about Dharma. You know, uh -huh. Right, right. Doing that which is most 
natural and appropriate for you, right? As opposed to for somebody else. And that's it. And that's right. it. And then you you become and then you fulfill that aspect of the universe. Yeah. And you you know you live you live from that infinite place inside. Yeah. Cool. So. Um, so you're, these days you live in Santa Fe, and your life consists of maybe doing some cranial sacral still. No, I don't no, do not that, that But you're having these light sessions with I, people. Right, I, and I do work over the phone a lot, uh -huh. um, and I do a lot of writing and editing. Just to, as a professional writer, just to make money? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's good to know. And uh, life tends to hand me some pretty interesting projects, yeah. which, is, which is nice. And uh, I, I'm outside every day. So, you know, I, I hike every day. That's really that earth type. Very much an earth person, and I yeah. draw a lot of sustenance and balance and joy from the earth. Mm -hmm. So I hike most days. Nice. Yeah. We talk a lot about moving out that way. Someplace <laughs> Colorado. High and Mexico. dry, humidity yeah. free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you uh, have a sense of what the coming years might bring, or are you just so much in the moment that you never think about it? Sometimes I'm given some I information, and even though it may change it, and I do know that for the next two years. I'm supposed to be out sharing my work, uh -huh. and that's all I know. So you, you travel around, meet with people, do your sessions, and right, stuff. right. I'm yeah. supposed to not just sit at home and wait for somebody to call, but actually go out and share. Yeah, you know. And so I do know that 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 seems to be what I'm supposed to do for the next few years and beyond, and I have no, I have no idea sense. what's going on. And it's fine. And yeah. it, it could, you know, that intuition could shift mm -hmm. next week, and that'd be fine too. Cool. <laughs> right. Well. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you kind of wish I had asked you about or that you were going to sort of wish you had said once we finished this and you, you think, oh, we should have talked about that, you yeah. know? I think just, just as much as possible to convey that life just is. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't need to overlay any interpretations on it. Yeah. And there are no goods, there are no bads, there are no lights, there are no darks unless we decide that it's like that, and then it becomes that for us. Mm. So life just is. Well, not to belabor this, but uh, <laughs> you know, let, let's say somebody is listening to this who's lost their job, and their house is uh -huh. going to be foreclosed, uh -huh. and they don't know what in the heck they're going to do, and they're scared to death, and they're, they're afraid they're going to live in a, end up in a tent or something. I mean, how do they relate to that? that advice of life just is? Can that help them in some practical way? I think, I know that sometimes everything is taken away mm -hmm. so that we can become something new. Mm -hmm. Now that's an interpretation. Yeah. You know, right away I made that's interpretation. But I think that people just need to learn to live in their hearts and, and find the inspiration, find what life is trying to say to them mm -hmm. in that given moment so that they can surrender to what life is, to where life is trying to take them. Yeah. And it seems like that's happened to you a number of times over the years. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> carry a I couple suitcases. Live, I still live month to month. No money don't own much. It, yeah, <laughs> somehow it just works out. It, that, that, that is it. Everything works out. I feel utterly taken care of. I never worry. Mm. Even though really I have nothing in the bank. I have no idea how I would ever retire or yeah. anything like that. But I, I'm fine. I'm uh -huh. really fine. There's that beautiful quote from the Bible, you know, the, the lilies of the field. See, yeah. I forget that what that's from. They, they don't toil or, or spin or sew, but, you know, even Solomon in all his glory is, you know, not adorned as one of these. And I don't know, I, I, I always garble my Bible quotes. Right, but, right. You know, the basic idea is God's going to take care of them, so if, he, if he's going to take such good care of these little lilies, what's he going to do about a human being who is right, so, right. so precious to him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also another way of saying, you know, it, just because you live in fulfillment doesn't mean you're a millionaire. Right. You know, it, it's it's it's. And just every, because you're a millionaire doesn't mean you live in fulfillment. Right. It's so so it's everybody is living out a different version of of reality, and it's perfect. Yeah. Hmm. Good. But, well, I can't think of a more perfect way to end the interview. So well, let's, thank you. Let's do that. All right, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Nice way to reconnect. <laughs> yeah. So uh, people who have been watching this, we can. Uh, there's a number of ways to watch it, and so you may be watching it on Facebook or YouTube or Bat Gap, which is Buddha at the gas pump, <laughs> um, or you might be listening to a podcast, or someone may have sent you an audio. But in any case, um, if you go to the sort of the nexus of all this is BatGap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which is, stands for Buddha at the gas pump. 
So if you go there, you will find all the interviews that have been done so far and all the ones that are going to be done, and you can subscribe to the you know, RSS feed and get it as a, you know, a, a blog thingy, however, whatever that's called. You, you can <laughs> it's getting late, so it's hard to remember. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm, I'm learning all this on the fly. I mean, I had no idea that how to set up a blog or a podcast or run a video camera. I'm just kind of doing this. Stuff. But um, in any case, that's the place to go. And uh, there's a mailing list you can get on to be notified of things and so on. So thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.